Hello, everyone. Welcome back to this Beyond Clean Brushing Up on Quality Conference. My name is Lindsay Brown with the Beyond Clean team. And if you weren't able to join us for the last session, I know there was uh, a little bit of an issue with the, the connection link. That session is going to be available on demand within the next half hour. We are so glad you're here. We're excited to talk all things dental reprocessing. And today's speakers are and will provide you with critical information about ensuring that your teams, your departments, and your dental instruments and devices are properly cared for. Just a couple of quick notes about your attendee screen. In the lower left-hand corner is a question and answers tool, which you can use to submit questions for your speaker at any time. On the right-hand side, you'll find speaker bio information. And in the top right, you'll find information that you can download to use as resources in your facility. I would like to welcome Nate Lawson. Nate is the director of the Division of Biomaterials at the University of Alabama in Birmingham School of Dentistry. He has published over 60 articles in peer-reviewed scientific and trade journals, 75 research abstracts, and three book chapters. To say that we're excited that Nate is here to talk with you today is an understatement. Nate is going to talk about how the ability to bond dental ceramics allows the practitioner to perform more conservative tooth preparations. It turns out there are many different types of dental ceramics available. So determining the correct protocol for each type of ceramic can be confusing. Um, each detail of the bonding procedure is based on research performed at the UAB School of Dentistry. And I'd like to welcome Nate Lawson to talk through this presentation. Hello, my name is Nate Lawson, and today my presentation was going to be about bonding to ceramic restorations. And so when we talk about bonding ceramic restorations, I really think that there's two components of it. One component is preparing the ceramic material so that it will stick to the resin cement. And then the other component of it is using a resin cement that's going to stick to the tooth. And so oftentimes what I'll see uh, with the debonded ceramic restoration is that when I look at the tooth and I look at this, the uh, debonded ceramic uh, restoration, is that the cement will be stuck on the inside surface of the ceramic restoration, meaning that we did a pretty good job bonding to the ceramic. It was actually, we had problems bonding to the tooth. So I think that actually this side of things, when today as we were talking about bonding to the tooth, is, is really important. I also give a lecture about bonding to the ceramic substrates and because there's a, a lot of confusion about that, but that's not, a, not what we're going to be uh, talking about today. So before I get into the lecture, I do have to give you a disclosure, and that is that um, I've received an honorarium today from 3M Oral Care for presenting this lecture. Uh, also, we do research with many of the major dental manufacturing companies, uh, and so the research I'm going to be showing you has been sponsored by 3M or other companies, some of it is unsponsored. It's all just kind of mixed in there together. And, um, and I have received honorarium to speak for other companies in the past. And so the perspective that I'm gonna be presenting uh, with you today is, is a little bit different. So, I mean, I'm a general dentist that practice what I call simple restorative dentistry. Uh, but my job is that I'm the director of biomaterials at the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Dentistry, the UAB School of Dentistry. And we have this dental laboratory where we can test all of the mechanical and adhesive properties of dental materials. And so I like to actually start by giving credit to some of these people. These are the smart individuals that actually do the research and come up with the data and then they uh, you know, give it to me and I'm able to do nice things like uh, present it and, you know, we published research together. So a lot of the research is, that I'm showing you today is actually going to be coming from this man right here, who's Chen Te Huang, who's the prosthodontist who completed our biomaterials master's program and went, uh, returned to Taiwan where he's from. He's um, on faculty at a hospital there. Um, but these are some of the other researchers who are currently working in our lab. So what you're going to be seeing today is a lot of data, uh, almost all the data, unless indicated otherwise, has come from, from our lab. So as we talk about bonding restorations, this is some, these are statistics I like to start with. Um, this is a paper that was published uh, in, G in um, the JADA, Journal of American Dental Association, uh, from um, our, a, a group of uh, researchers that I worked with uh, through the Practice-Based Research Network. And what we did in this 
uh, paper was we looked at th about 3,500 crowns cemented by 200 dentists practicing in the United States, so pri private practicing dentists. And every time they would go to insert the crowns, they had to record a bunch of factors, uh, but one of the factors was what type of cement did they use. And we used that data to figure out what percentage of crowns in the United States, or an estimate of the percentage of crowns in the United States that were bonded versus being conventionally cemented with the glass onomer or resin modified glass onomer material. And we found out that about 40% of crowns in the United States were being bonded with the resin cement. And then we went you know, further looking into this data and we looked to see about you know, four different types of materials, how frequently crowns were bonded versus cemented. So uh, what we saw was that about 70% of lithium based silicates, also known as Emax crowns were bonded, whereas the majority of zirconia crowns were cemented. About 70% of them were cemented with resin modified glass onomer materials, and only about 30% of those were bonded. And so to me, that, that more or less makes sense. As we're going to talk about today, I'm going to be talking about bonding, but I'm also going to be talking a little bit about you know, what are the advan advantages of conventionally cementing a crown. Uh, so, you know, the fact is that you know, I, I would agree with this, this, that about, you know, lithium disilicate materials, most of those I bond, basically all of them I bond. In zirconia, it just kind of varies a lot. If a lot of the full coverage crowns I'm doing, I'll conventionally cement with RMGI and some of them I'll bond. And so that's kind of what we'll be talking about today. And since I am showing you the results of this practice based research network, study, I, I do want to put in a little plug for the practice-based research network. Um, this is something, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll be presenting and as you'll see, I'll be showing, you know, clinically relevant research throughout the presentation. Uh, and I'll have people sometimes come up to me and they'll say, hey, Nate, I'd be interested in doing some research. I'm practicing dentist. Maybe I could fly or drive to UAB and we could do something in the lab. I'm thinking that's a lot. That's a big time commitment. That doesn't really work. I and mean, people have actually tried it before. But you know, if you're in practice and you'd like to become more involved with maybe a little research project or advancing dentistry, the Practice-Based Research Network is actually made for that. It's a, um, it's, there's a big NIH grant, about $65 million NIH grant to support this. And what it does is it does little studies out, in, or not little, they're actually pretty big studies out in private practices. And you can join as a private practitioner, the Practice-Based Research Network, and they'll actually give you small reimbursement, small reimbursement for your patients to enroll them in the studies and collect a little bit of information about it. And here is the website to go uh, to sign up for that if you'd be interested. So I always like to put a little uh, plug in for that because it's something I really believe in. But anyhow, on to what what uh, we were going to talk about, which was, you know, 70% of zirconia restorations are, are conventionally cemented, 70% of lithium to silicate are bonded. And so what I mean by those two terms, cementing versus bonding. So this is how I, I different, define these terms. If you go to the glossary of prosthodontic terms, they're, they're not actually defined. So th this was the best way that I, I've come up to define them. So when I think about bonding, I think that that implies that there's some type of chemical bond between the tooth and your resin cement, and some type of chemical bond between the um, resin cement and the ceramic material. So between the tooth and the cement, I put a little asterisk here. Uh, so that's because you know there are resin cements that can be adhesively bonded by applying some type of primer or bonding agent on the tooth before you apply the resin cement. And then there's other types of resin cements that are what we call self-adhesive. And I still consider that a bonding, uh, you know, bonding a crown if you're using a self-adhesive resin cement. And then, you know, the, the chemical bond between the resin cement and the crown material is typically accomplished with a, a primer, uh, like silane for lithium silicate or the molecule MDP for zirconia. And again, there are some cements that contain these primers within the cement. So as long as that primer is there and there's that chemical bond, then I would still consider that bonding. And I'm contrasting that with cementation. 
So cementation, I just think of using a glass onomer or resin modified glass onomer. I also consider bond or cementing rather because there's no chemical bond between your ceramic material and the resin cement. There is going to be some type of bond, I guess, if we're if we're going to be technical about it. There is going to be some type of bond between your resin, I mean, your resin modified glass onomer or glass onomer material and the tooth. There's that ionic bond between calcium and tooth in the uh, polyacrylic acid in glass onomer based cements, uh, but it's not as strong as that hybrid layer that forms between um, resin cements and the bonding agent in the tooth. So. Uh, this is, as we go through in this presentation, that's how I'm defining things. I'm talking about bonding, re uh, chemical bonds between all the substrates with resin cement, and cementing is either glass onomer or resin modified glass onomer cement. So you know, even though we're talking about bonding, there's a lot of advantages of conventionally cementing uh, a crown. So some of the advantages are it's just easier. There's less steps. Um, and it's, and it's faster to conventionally cement a crown. Also, it's, it's more forgiving procedure. You don't have to achieve uh, at, you know, the type of isolation that you need to achieve with RMGI cements that you do with resin cements, and I'll show you some data about that. Another thing is RMGI materials can be protective of the margins of the crown because they release fluoride. So I'm gonna go through and give you some some data on all that. There's there's maybe a fourth uh, advantage that I haven't yet added to the slides, but you know one of the biggest challenges if we're talking about ceramic materials can be removing them. And so, if you think about having to to drill off or or, or cut off a um, zirconia or lithium silicate crown, you know we have to imagine that it's going to be easier to remove it if it's conventionally cemented versus it being bonded. So that might even be a fourth advantage of conventionally cementing uh, ceramic materials. Well, let's go through and give some, some evidence for this. So when I talk about easier, I mean it's just, it's just easier because there's less steps required to bond a, or sorry, cement a crown with resin modified glass ionomer uh, because you don't have to go through all the steps of preparing the crown. Um, you, uh, you know, if you're bonding a uh, lithium disilicate or zirconia crown, not only do you have to apply a primer, but you have to clean out saliva out of the inside of the crown and then apply your primer and then use your resin cement and achieve good isolation on the tooth. With the RMGI cement or glass onomer cement, you don't need to do those steps. And there's some people that would say, well, I, I apply a primer on the inside of my uh, zirconia crowns before I bond them with RMGI because I think that provides a higher bond or I clean out the saliva. You know, I would argue it's not necessary because there's not a bond between the zirconia and the RMGI cement. Um, here was a, this was a study uh, that was from Journal of Adhesive Dentistry that looked at the bond between zirconia and RMGI cements uh, and the bond between zirconia and resin cements with and without the use of a primer. So you can see with, with an RMGI cement, this is, that's the pink bars here, with the RMGI cement of those pink bars, you know, if you don't use the, I mean, sorry, if you do not use a primer like in this first bar, or if you do use a, a, some type of ceramic primer like that found in a ceramic primer or, or a universal adhesive, there's, there's no difference in the bond that you get to the zirconia. Whereas a, a resin cement they showed you know, you get a higher bond if you use a resin cement and you have to use a primer because if you don't use a primer, you got a very low bond to the zirconia. So, so in my mind, this, this study shows that, you know, and we've done studies, we did a study similar to this that showed that, you know, applying an additional primer on the inside of zirconia, also the same thing um, with lithium disilicate, applying a primer on the inside of the crown, if you're going to use an RMGI cement, doesn't really do anything. So I say, why bother doing the extra step? So that's why I say RMGI is the easier. You just, you know, you can try them in, rinse them out with water, fill the crown up with RMGI cement, you know, try it. It's, it's always nice to rinse off the crown and, and get it, you know, just clean but moist and seat the crown. Uh, but I'll show you here in a second about, you know, what, what about the tooth? How, how uh, what happens if the tooth is not uh, completely clean? So can you bond or can you cement or bond 
a crown when the preparation looks like that. So, you know, oftentimes when we talk about bonding fillings, we, we know that we need to have a nice um, dry uh, tooth structure. So we'll use a rubber dam or some type of isolation, but then we'll go and bond a crown in an environment like this. And we don't think as much about getting good isolation. But I would, I would argue that adhesive bonding, adhesively bonding a crown is the same thing. It's adhesive bonding. So if we can't get good isolation, we probably should not be using a resin cement. And again, let me show you a little bit of evidence for that. Um, so this was, the, this was one of the studies I used to quote a lot. I really like it. It, it was a study done on bovine teeth. Uh, to bovine dentin, so cow dentin, and they did a, a shear bond strength test where they looked at the bond uh, between the dentin and different types of, um, you know, glass on or RMGI or, or resin, and they showed that with resin you clearly get a higher bond to dentin, but if you contaminated the surfaces with saliva and then you try to bond to them, you'd see that the resin cement fell dramatically. And so the RMG, RMGI in that case actually provided a higher bond to the dentin. So it's kind of evidence that, you know, if you can't get good moisture contaminate or, or uh, moisture isolation or, or um, yeah, I would not use a resin cement. One of the criticisms of that study, or not a criticism, but just you know, an observation about that study is they did something like I just showed you there, which was a shear bond strength test. Uh, we have been doing this other type of test, and I'll, I'm gonna show you a lot of data that we do with this type of test. Um, it's what informally called a crown pull test or, or a crown retention test. We start off by making actual crown preparations and what I call a rapid crown prepper. I also have an idea to modify this for, for patients and you get them sitting in a swivel chair and you just hold your, no, that wouldn't work, but we make these little um, standardized crown preparations and they look like this. And then we make uh, crowns that, that have these, this bar going across the top of it so we can pull them off and we do this uh, crown retention test. And so we did one of these crown retention tests actually coating the tooth in saliva before we bonded to it. So we didn't even dry it off. We just coated the whole tooth in saliva, some real human saliva in the lab, and then we would bond right on top of it and looked at the retention of uh, uh, zirconia crowns cemented with RMGI and resin cements uh, after they'd been contaminated. And this is how we do the pull the crown test. So here's the tooth. Here's that crown I showed you and we pull it off and we record the force it takes to remove that, um, that crown. So here's the data that we got. So in this case, again, when, when we had uh, the, the crowns were, I mean, the tooth preparations were clean, we didn't have saliva contamination. We had, we'd see a higher bond with the resin cements than we did with the RMGI cements, but once we contaminated their surfaces with saliva, we saw pretty similar data they saw with, with the cow dentin, that you would decrease the bond with when using resin cements, but with RMGI cements, there was no decrease in the bond. So I would argue that if you can't get good isolation, you, you're better off just cementing with an RMGI cement than uh, using a resin cement. So if you can't get good isolation, don't bother to use a resin cement. Um, one little trick, I learned this from one of my um, good friends and another faculty member is Dr. Gusta Robles. He showed me uh, this method to achieve kind of temporary isolation in the posterior mandible, which I think is the most challenging place to achieve good isolation. And this is to use two cardboard triangles, putting one in the lingual vestibule and one in the buccal vestibule, kind of splaying them open, and you get a little bit of time for isolation and, and a crown preparation. Uh, so if, if, if that trick helps, it's, it's a good one. Okay, so we showed it's easier. We showed that it's more moisture tolerant. 
The other advantages of, of RMGI cement is that they can release some fluoride and that fluoride can help protect the margins of the crowns. So like if you've got this patient, you know, who's been kind of stabilized with silver diamine fluoride here, and he's gonna need to have some, some of these teeth prepared for um, crowns, <coughs> uh, you know, he's a high carries risk patient, obviously. I mean, hopefully, you know, we've done a lot of oral hygiene instruction trying to improve his carries risk, but he's still, in my mind, a pretty high carries risk patient. You know, would, what type of cement would best help protect the margins of those crown restorations, you know, once the teeth were prepared for crowns? So that's where uh, um, glass onomer cements come in, resin modified glass onomer cements, but also some of these newer bioactive cements. So um, we did a study where we were looking at a, an RMGI cement. Uh, additionally, we looked at uh, this is a self adhesive resin cement that releases calcium. This is another kind of, I think it's a resin, resin plus ionomer combo. This is a glass onomer plus calcium aluminate based cement. Um, Ceramir, also known as uh, Calibra Bio. Um, so we compared these cements for some of their bioactive properties. So the first, uh, oh, and one of the things that differentiates some of these newer bioactive cements versus a RMGI cement is that they will release calcium. So calcium is one of the minerals found in the, or one of the elements found in the mineral content of tooth hydroxyapatite. So if you have a material that releases calcium, presumably that could also help prevent demineralization, which is the beginning of recurrent caries around crown margins. So we took a look at the uh, ion release profiles of some of these different cements, including the bioactive and the RMGI. We found that some of the bioactive cements release calcium. So Therosem released a good amount of calcium. Ceramir released a good amount of calcium. The RMGI didn't really release calcium as we would not expect it to. Um, the, uh, if we looked at fluoride release, the RMGI material had the most fluoride released. Uh, the Ceramir Calibra Bio had some fluoride release since it's a calcium aluminate uh, RMGI kind of uh, hybrid, and the other materials had you know, lower fluoride release. So that was just kind of an init initial testing to see, you know, that the ions came out of these materials. But we wanted to, you know, know how well these materials protect the margins of a restoration. And so we have this test that we do to test bioactivity. It's not a perfect test. I'll show you some of its limitations, but it's a test that we've been developing for the past couple of years. It's kind of challenging to do. Um, and so maybe as we evolve the test, we'll make some improvements on it. But let me show you what we've done and what we found out. So the way we do this test is we get an extracted tooth and we put a little um, box at the CEJ of that tooth. And we fill that box up with whatever we're testing. So we've tested adhesives that are supposed to be bioactive. We tested restorative materials that are supposed to be bioactives. And in this case, we're testing cements. And honestly, the most clinically applicable way that we could have tested this for cements would have been to prepare this tooth for crown preparation and then made a, a ceramic crown to go over it and then fill that crown up with the cement we wanted to test. And then, you know, actually we could have tested a cement gap, you know, but Practically, that's just very time consuming and expensive to make for the amount of specimens that we need to do to make that many crown preparations. So we, we kind of estimated that by just making a little box and just filling it up with the, with the cement material. So it's not a perfect test, but you know, it's something that's, um, you know, is, is a good way to compare different types of materials. So once we filled that little box up with cement, we would paint the um, everywhere aside from the margins of, around, of tooth around that restoration or that cement with a acid resistant varnish. And then we would put them into what we call the artificial caries model, where we cycled between acid and neutral solution. And we did this for a little over a month. And we'd 
when we see these demineralizations form on some of the specimens and we take them out, we'd embed them into acrylic and then we would section them up into these very thin sections. And when I say we, I should be saying Dr. Huang who did all these specimens and made 100 micron thick specimens. And then we would observe the margin between the root dentin and the cement under polarized light microscopy. So if this was our specimen, we'd be looking at that margin right there. And we'd be looking specifically at the part, at the root dentin to see how well that cement material protected that margin. And what I mean by protection, so if here is the, the resin modified glass on our cement, and here's where it meets the root dentin margin, that little bit of root dentin right next to the resin modified glass on our cement uh, would actually be protected from demineralization. So this area that has a color change here is where the root dentin was becoming demineralized. You know, it's starting from the exterior surface and moving inward. But at the area right next to the RMGI, it did not become demineralized because there was a pr protective effect of, uh, we think, ion release from the cement. And so we compared that for um, several of the, you know, of all the different cements we tested this. We looked at these zones of protection. And what we'd see is that, you know, the, the resin modified glass sonomers would have a pretty big zone of protection. The root dent or the um, resin cements would actually show what we call wall lesions around the root dent. I'll show you another specimen where it's more exaggerated where actually we'd see more demineralization next to the resin cement than there was uh, at the surface of the lesion. So it actually, uh, it was actually worse. And then the bioactives would show a zone of protection, albeit not quite at the level of the resin modified glass onerous material. So here's, here's the cements we actually tested. So this is a better example of a wall lesion. So this is where there's actually more demineralization on the root dent next to the cement than there is at all other, uh, you know, at the other places of, along the route. So that that's typical with resin cements is that they'll actually, at that margin, there'll be more demineralization. You could see there's these zones of protection for the RMGI material. And then the bioactive materials showed, um, you know, protection, but not quite at the level of RMGI. And we actually were able to publish this study recently. Um, and so we quantified, you know, we made multiple specimens for all the different cements, and we measured the, what we call the wall lesions, where we saw more demineralization of the resin cements, and we measured how much protection there was of the RMGI or bioactive cements. And you can see here, um, you know, the protective effects of the, of the bioactives, but again, we, we saw more protection uh, with the RMGI cement materials. Not saying the bioactives are bad because, you know, like Theracin, for example, is a resin cement. So it has some of the advantages of a resin cement, uh, but it releases some of these ions. But as far as the true bioactivity or protective effect, you know, I think the RMGIs uh, still kind of reign king. All right. So those are the advantages of conventionally cementing. Again, it's easier. It's more moisture tolerant. And you also get this protective effect. Then why do we talk about bonding? Because the big advantage of bonding ceramic materials is that you can do uh, more conservative types of preparations or, um, and you can some, uh, bond them to get additional retention. So you can, if you use a resin cement and you bond a restoration, you're going to get more retention of that, uh, the cement's going to provide more retention. And then also in the case of lithium based silicates, and even to, to an extent, maybe zirconia, uh, you can strengthen a ceramic restoration when you reinforce it by bonding it to the tooth preparation. So those are the, those are the advantage uh, of um, bonding restoration. So let me talk about that a little bit more. So, uh, you know, the, the, the traditional um, prosthodontic uh, definition for or a recommendation for when you should bond a restoration would be if the tooth is too short or it's what I call little TP preps, like they're just over tapered. Uh, so the TP preps, they say that that angle is 12 degrees if taper is just the one, one wall. So I guess total occlusal convergence would be both. So that'd be 24 degrees. I don't know how you 
you know, it's hard to measure that, but if it kind of looks like a TP, that's, that's, you know, uh, would mean it's kind of a over prepared or over tapered preparation or then it's height. So the, the height for premolars is three millimeters. If that had been a molar, the recommended height that you need to conventionally cement it is four millimeters. So if you don't have sufficient height or if it's over uh, tapered, that's one of the, the reasons for, con for uh, bonding full coverage crowns. Or the way that I've kind of been moving in, in my you know, simple restorative practice is doing a lot more of these partial coverage restorations. Uh, so anytime I'm doing a partial coverage restoration uh, like, like this, I'm going to be having to, to bond it because it's just a non-retentive preparation. So that's, you know, these are, like I said, this is, um, this is a lab in Mississippi that's been making a lot of these for me uh, and it's called Aesthetics Reconstructions. And they, um, if, if you look at my lab, the, the number of restorations I've sent to them and uh, my, my 2020 numbers were not so high because it was going quarantine for a lot of that, but the percentage of crowns versus these partial coverage is much more partial coverage than crowns. Um, so that's kind of the direction I'm moving. So I'm doing a lot more bonding and bonding is becoming more important. You know, even, and, you know, weird little things like, like this endo crown, this was one of the ones I did a couple of years ago and we had an in, in-house in uh, technician training program. And so one of the technician, uh, technicians who was in training and now out in, um, uh, out in practice uh, made this neat little endo crown thing for me. I call this an Alabama molar because it's just a molar. There was no other teeth around it. He just said, I need a top for it. It looked like this. It looked essentially it was prepped like this before I saw it. And uh, he said, there's no top on that molar. So we, we bonded a little lithium disilicate uh, endo crown on there. And so most of the time, if I'm doing something that's not retentive, I'm going to be bonding a lithium disilicate uh, material. And in, I talk a lot about bonding zirconia, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but if I've got adequate reduction and I'm doing some of these non-retentive things, I'm bonding a lot of lithium disilicate. But there are some limitations of lithium disilicate is, you know, you do you really do need a minimum uh, thickness to bond it in the posterior area, um, in the anterior area too, but you need a, a minimum kind of thickness to prevent fracture of the restoration. And particularly, you know, when you get to some of these thin, thin sections of the restoration, it can become... Uh, susceptible to fracture. And what is that thickness? So this was a study that we had done a couple of years ago where we were looking at lithium disilicate material, Emax, and we compared it to zirconia. So this was the, this is the traditional zirconia I used for most of my posterior restorations. So the 3Y zirconia. We also tested some of the newer 5Y translucent zirconia. And we cemented some of them with RMGI cement, and then we bonded some with a, a self-adhesive resin cement, and we compared their strength. Oh, and, the, the, and I forgot to mention, these restorations were all at uh, about 0.8 millimeter thickness at the, at the um, central fossa. So at their thinnest point, they were 0.8 millimeter thick restorations. So these were on the edge of like what we could get away with um, for either type of material. So, you know, the recommendation for bonded Emax is a millimeter. The recommendation for, for zirconia, some people said 0.6, some people say 0.8. So these were, these were pretty thin restorations. And then we fractured these crowns and, what, and we found some interesting um, things. Uh, first of all, at this thickness, the lithium disilicate materials, if they weren't bonded, uh, you know, if, if we saw the, if we just use a, a resin modified glass onomer cement, you see there's no bar here. And that's because before we fractured them, we fatigued them and they all failed in fatigue. So we were, you know, way outside of the recommendations of this material. So that's, that explains why it didn't perform well, because we we're using it, you know, it's supposed to be at 1.5 millimeters if it's conventionally cemented. Uh, and so we were using a 0.8. So it's, it's no wonder it failed prematurely. But what that tells me, you know, one of the things there that tells me is that uh, lithium disilicate, if it's not bonded, you know, at that thickness is very fragile. So you have to be careful 
uh, with it, and I'll tell you the relevance of that in a second. Uh, the other thing that we, we saw in this test was that at that 0.8 millimeter thickness, the bonded lithium basilicate actually had the same strength as the zirconia that was not not bonded. So, you know, that means that that 0.81 and maybe 1.2 millimeters, that bonded lithium basilicate is, is, is pretty good. Um, but the bonded zirconia did even even better. You know, once the zirconia, the three Y zirconia was bonded, did even better. So it gave me a little bit of, you know, kind of good feeling about if I've got that that thin of a restoration below the recommendation of which uh, lithium to silicate should be bonded, that 0.8 millimeters, that if I want to get the full strength, the bonded zirconia is, is probably the way way to go. So. Okay, so going back to that thing I, I told you about with lithium disilicate before, it gets, if it's not bonded, it doesn't quite get its strength. And that's, you know, one of the, the, the disadvantages or one of the things I had to learn to overcome with using more posterior lithium disilicate is this, tr these are all crowns that I did that failed in try-in. And this is when I was first learning how to use this material. This was this clinical trial we were running, and, and I'm going to blame myself on all of these uh, because I was using it at pretty close to the, um, and sometimes even below the recommended thickness, and I'd try the crowns in, and then they'd fracture and, tr and try in. So, you know, one, I learned I really have to get to the recommended thickness for lithium to silicate, and then I had I learned I had to be careful and try in. So if I'm trying these crowns in, a lot of times I'll try them in real lightly before they're bonded just to make sure we're not way out of occlusion, and then I'll check my final occlusion once the crowns actually get bonded in. And again, the other thing I learned is that I really have to, um, I really have to get the recommended thickness for these materials, which is a millimeter. And sometimes I even like going to 1.2 millimeters with bonded lithium disilicates. Uh, it's with bonded zirconia where I feel like I can get a little bit thinner, the 0.8 to one millimeter occlusal reduction. So I've gotten more into using depth reduction and instead of buying a, a special burr for this, I found out that uh, the 329 burrs that we order are about 1.2 millimeters uh, thick, or that's how the cutting tip of, of this material is about 1.2. So I use this for uh, bonding, I mean, for bonded lithium to silicate preparations. And then for zirconia, a number two round burr is about a millimeter. So I can use that to get to about between the 0.8 and one millimeter closal reduction uh, for zirconia. Uh, for if it's bonded. And so here is, here's just an example of if these were prepared for lithium disilicate, that's a 1.2 millimeter reduction with a 329 burr to just make sure that I get adequate occlusal reduction. Okay, so I told you that I do a, a lot of lithium disilicate for partial coverage restorations when I really want to get a good uh, bond, and I try to get that 1 to 1.2 millimeter reduction. But there's some times where I, I still find the need to bond zirconia, and I'll tell you about you know where that comes in, is this is probably the most common bonded zirconia for me would be the uh, second molar crown. We've got really or it can be any, mole, any type of molar crown, but often it occurs in the second molar, where the tooth is just really short. And I'm trying to keep the margins equa or super gingival because it makes hygiene and impressioning and bonding so much easier. But I don't have a lot of occlusal, um, I don't have a lot of uh, occlusal clearance. And that causes me to uh, have a minimum thickness for my ceramic material, but also minimum uh, height of my crown preparation. So I need to bond something here. And because of that limited uh, restoration thickness, I'm choosing to use the zir zirconia because I'm really close to the recommended, um, you know, getting to that one to 0.8 millimeter thickness here. So that, that's one of the cases where I'm thinking about bonding zirconia. The other one is, you know, we talk a lot about Maryland bridges. I'm always honest about this. I, you know, I don't know how many I've done. I've done probably definitely less than five. I can't remember how many of these, maybe, yeah, very few in my career. Uh, but 
for some reason, it's a big topic of, of conversation. I said, what, what are you going to do? Are you, if you would do a Maryland bridge, would you do it out of zirconia or would you do it out of lithium basilica? And in my mind, the, all the ones I've ever done have all been out of uh, zirconia. And the reason for that is because the failures I've seen with these, not, not just mine, but of others, have been fracture at that connector. Um, at least that's the, the ultimate failures that I, when I've seen failed restorations or heard people talk about them is that there's a fracture of that connector. If you use zirconia, you're going to get a stronger connector. And, uh, you know, w w what could maybe be the worst thing is if you saw debonding of that wing. And I just think to myself, well, debonding of that wing is an easier fit. Uh, it's not, it's just a complication. It's an easier complication to deal with than fracture of that connector. So in my mind, you know, the bonded zirconia makes more sense for a Maryland bridge. And then there's other kind of random applications sometimes where, uh, you know, you think about bonding zirconia. This was um, one of our dental students at UAB Kelsey, and she had uh, prepared this uh, tooth for a, uh, uh, with a rest seat for a removable partial denture. And then when she sent it off to the laboratory, the laboratory said, well, when you put our, your rest seat in here, there's inadequate thickness to use lithium disilicate. Uh, so what do you want us to do? And so the, the, what she decided with her covering faculty member is to do a zirconia uh, onlay here. And so that way they could, it would be stronger so they could prepare that rest seed in there. And so then they had to go ahead and bond the zirconia restoration. So basically all I'm saying is that I still think that there's a place for bonding zirconia, you know, probably, again, most of the bonded restorations are going to be lithium disilicate, but I think it's important to know how to do both. So if we're going to be bonding either one of these materials, which type of cement would we use? And this was a study we did uh, pretty recently where we looked at bonding um, zirconia and lithium disilicate with either a self-adhesive resin cement or with a resin cement that was accompanied with a bonding agent that went on the tooth. So we were using the Unisem 2 as a self-adhesive and Y ultimate Scotch bond uh, as the cement that was being used with an adhesive. So what we found was that for zirconia, we didn't see a big difference between using a self-adhesive resin and using a resin cement with a bonding agent. And actually, I was kind of surprised about this data, but uh, this was, again, a project by Dr. Bong, who always, you know, always had really nice uh, data. Um, and so I, we had kind of seen, um, you know, th there have been other studies that had shown similar things. Uh, and so when we got in our lab, too, I kind of thought, well, you know, this is that maybe not necessary to go the extra mile with zirconia to apply the adhesive on the tooth before bonding it. So I'll be honest, after we had this study, I've been using a lot more self-adhesive resin for bonding zirconia crowns and not going the extra mile and needing to use a resin cement that had adhesive in it. When we looked at the uh, lithium basilicate crowns, we saw that you know this, this was the bond strength that we got with the self-adhesive, and this was the bond strength that we got if we used the resin cement with a separate adhesive on the tooth. And even though the bars don't look that different, uh, I think the bars are misrepresenting the data because this bar should probably be way up here on the chart because we just tested the failure of our system. Like what happened was that all of the, all of the specimens failed, the actual tooth broke itself. Sometimes the crowns even went with fracture before we could debond the lithium disilicate crowns when we were using the resin cement with the adhesive on the tooth. So this is this is what the specimens actually look like. You see the, the tooth would fracture inside the crown before we could actually test it. This one, the, the whole root of the tooth broke off. And here the, the tooth broke off inside of the crown and the tooth, you know, this root fractured off. So we were just breaking everything before we could even test that bond. So to me, that's when you're bonding lithium basilicate, I think it's definitely worth it to do the extra step of applying the adhesive onto the onto the tooth and then also just what I'm using them for you know most of the time like I said I'm using zirconia for the majority of the time is for these short second molar crowns which I think are going to be more retentive than my overlay type of preparations that I'm bonding uh, with 
or lithium disilicate. So most of the time when I'm bonding zirconia, I had it in my mind to use self-adhesive resin cement. And then when I'm bonding lithium disilicate, I like to put the bonding agent on the tooth beforehand. And so I'm actually going to show you, be showing you some kind of a new material here. Uh, so this is uh, the newest material coming out from 3M, and I think it's just being released. Um, you know, as I'm speaking right now, I'm not sure if it's even out or it's right about to come out. So it's brand new. And what they've done in this system is kind of realizing there's going to be people like me that like to sometimes use self-adhesive resin cement and sometimes use a resin cement associated with a bonding agent. So they have their new resin cements called Relax Universal that can be used with a bonding agent on the tooth, or it can be used in a self-adhesive mode without the bonding agent on the tooth. So to me, I think that's kind of neat. It allows me to do, you know, be used for both of the two applications that I'm using the most, so for zirconia and lithium basilicate. And you might wonder, well, how does this material, how does this cement perform? Um, and it's funny, I, I thought I didn't know because when, you know, we've done some testing for 3M and they sent us a bunch of materials and they were in little funny marked packages. We didn't really know what we were testing. And so I've had data for a long time. I just didn't know that what we tested was this until they uh, revealed to us like, oh yeah, those cements we sent you, those were this relaxed universal material. So actually we've even published some of the results on this cement as abstracts and didn't really even know what we were testing. They kind of kept it the, the true cement name under wraps. So, so we've, we've tested the cement and, and again published this data as an abstract back in 2019 uh, where we were using this uh, cement bonding to zirconia crowns, which is where in a self-adhesive mode, which is what I would actually do clinically. Like if I was bonding a zirconia crown, I'd be using a self-adhesive resin cement. And so this was the original Unisem, and then this was their new uh, Relax Universal. And this was using the, the cement without any types of primer on the tooth. Actually, we didn't even use a primer on the zirconia because this has a phosphate functional group that is kind of like having the primer inside of the cement, similar uh, to how Panavia SA has got MDP in their cement. This has got uh, a phosphate functional group. So all of these cements were actually tested without even applying a primer on the inside of the zirconia restoration, and they all did uh, very well. And then when we looked at bonding to lithium disilicate or Emacs, this data I think has not been um, published yet. This is some of our internal data where we've, or actually I think this one actually was published as, a, um, as an abstract, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, but what we did in this study was we were bonding to lithium disilicate and we use adhesive on the tooth and then we use the, the resin cement. And here is the Relix universal cement used with the new uh, adhesive, which is called Scott's Bond Universal Plus. And so we applied that to the tooth and then used it in combination with the resin cement. And again, you could see it kind of tops the, the, the bar chart. So it does both and it does well in both modes, uh, which is a really you know good sign for the cement. They've done some other things when they put the cement out. It's funny how cheap we are as dentists that this is a big deal. Uh, so They've changed the tip so that you waste less cement when you extrude it out of the tip. So these tips are both, they're not like, they're not a true size, but they're both at the same magnification. So that's how small this teeny little tip is now so that you don't waste so much material that'll save money. You know, as an academic, I don't have to buy materials. The, the school buys them. I mean, I'm sure they get somehow taken out of our overhead, but you know, it's not as big of a deal. Uh, but I know that that's a big deal is to save money on, on um, waste, not wasting so much material. The other thing that's new with this material that's kind of neat is they've made their uh, adhesive, the Scotch Bond Universal Plus, that's associated with the cement more radiopaque. And that's what they said in their marketing brochures. And I'm a, I'm a skeptical person, so I wanted to test it uh, myself. So I just got a Dappen dish and I uh, filled it with just a drop of adhesive of both kinds. I couldn't remember, you know, the naming was confusing. The, this is the Scotch Bond Universal Plus, and this is the original one. So I called this one new and this one old. And then I just took a radiograph of them. And just to confirm that the new one, the Scotch Bond Universal Plus, was more radio opaque than the old one 
uh, which was radiolucent. So I think that's kind of a neat feature of this new adhesive that's associated with the cement. So with that, uh, I'd like to say, you know, thank you so much for um, listening to this presentation. These are some places where you can go and find out more information. This is our Instagram account. It's called at Dentinal Tube. And we post educational uh, content on there about dental materials, about restorative dentistry, and all, and all types of dentistry, actually, as we've expanded it. And I do this with some of my really uh, good friends and colleagues at the school, Dr. Gusto Robles and Celine Arce here, who uh, Dr. Robles is the director of operative. Dr. Arce is a board certified prosthodontist. So they kind of help me um, you know, with the con with the content there and make it more clinically uh, engaging and um, they're just some of my really great friends. And then this is my website, drnightlawson.com. Uh, you can go onto this resources tab and it'll, it'll kind of tell you, uh, you'll get some articles that you can find about bonding restorations. And I think there's one or two posted up there that talk about preparing the ceramic surface and how to do that. Additionally, there's a, there's a guide for how to prepare the ceramic surface on our Instagram account too. You can go in and find it on there. So again, thank you so much. All right. Dr. Lawson, thank you so much for providing that information. Um, what a great way to really dive into the dental setting and more specifically into uh, bonding dental ceramics. Uh, I wanna make sure that you get connected to the webcam. Uh, okay. Um, if you go ahead and say a couple words, I can see if it- Can you hear me words. okay? Yes, I sure can. There we go, wonderful, oh, perfect. wonderful. <laughs> Thank you again for providing that information. We did have a couple of great questions that came through. And if anyone does have additional questions for Dr. Lawson, feel free to submit those in the question and answer tool on the lower left-hand side of your page. Uh, Dr. Lawson, the first question is more of a, a, a generalized question. What drew your interest to study bonding of dental ceramics? I think it's fascinating. Uh, and I'm curious uh, how you really got this far into it. No, that's a great question. Like it's funny because a lot of people would say, you know, that dental materials is one of their least favorite subjects in dental school. And I always thought that was crazy because it was one of my favorite subjects in dental school. Um, I guess it's just how you look at it. There was um, my background is in before dental school and college was engineering. And so I think that that's probably where I, um, why I like that topic. Um, and additionally, I had to, uh, had a really great mentor, a guy named um, John Burgess, who I still work for, who's kind of a legend in the, in the field of dental materials. So I think that helped make it more exciting. So I kind of just followed in his footsteps, literally everywhere he went. I thought I, I, um, I worked with him when he was in New Orleans and he's the guy that brought me, uh, uh to Alabama, this, uh, so I think that that's, you know, that was how I got this interest in dental materials. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a passion that stayed with me. So I still, still find it very, very fun. <laughs> <laughs> that's an important thing, finding it fun. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, awesome. Uh, this next question is specific to some of the issues that sterile processing and dental instrument reprocessing professionals face. Oftentimes, when we're reprocessing dental instruments used in applying bonding materials, such as cement, the bonding material uh -huh. adheres to the surgical device, and it is so hard to remove. In your expertise, how can dental professionals utilize point of care treatment to have better outcomes for the people doing the reprocessing? And what barriers do you think prevent this practice? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, so when we think about like the different dental um, adhesives, like adhesives, composites, cements, anything, they're all, most of all of these different types of uh, materials that we're using are similar chemistry. They're all these methacrylate based um, uh, materials and the solvents that are usually the best at removing them either from uh, metal or plastic instruments are either alcohol like ethanol or using acetone um, and so acetone is a stronger solvent so acetone would be like nail polish remover um, and that can sometimes be a really good solvent for removing tenaciously bound 
composite or cement from um, any type of uh, surface. Uh, sometimes, like, if you're thinking about the curing light tip or something like that and you want to clean the surface of that off and you use something like acetone, sometimes I could be a little bit nervous because that can um, – that can maybe dissolve some of the adhesives that are used maybe to like glue certain parts of uh, of a multi-part component together. Uh, so maybe using something like a uh, ethanol, which is alcohol wipes, that could be a little bit safer. Um, but from the most tenacious stuff, uh, alcohol or uh, the uh, ethanol, sorry, acetone-based things like nail polish remover can be really good. And then my go-to though is like alcohol. So like those little, it's funny because you could just, I mean, they're super cheap, those little uh, alcohol pads that you just, you know, like you'd buy from the grocery store. Um, and I, I've priced them out. They're like three cents or something for one of those. And they're super great for cleaning off instruments, uh, even if, like, you've got cured composite on the tip of, of a metal instrument or a plastic instrument. It's the, those I, I find have been really great at cleaning things off to keep as nice as, as you're working to keep your instruments tidy so that if you use it one time and then you have to go back and put it in the patient's mouth again, it doesn't have a glob of something stuck on it. But then, yeah, also to keep your instruments, you know, uh, you know, staying clean for a long time. Because, yeah, once you put those composite uh, containing instruments into the autoclave, if you don't get it off, I mean, that, then it just gets really nasty. So, uh, yeah, I think those are uh, those little two cent alcohol wipes as your, I, I think you call it a point of care. Is that the the um, the, the the professional uh, term for it of yeah. of keeping your instruments clean during your procedure? Um, I think that's a really great great trick, I, and I think of it actually mostly from the handling standpoint of just it's easier to use clean instruments, but also to you know if you can clean them while you're working, it's, it makes them last longer too. So and it's more you know uh, I, from an infection control point, I, you know I think that's great to you know not have other people's dental materials on the next patient's instruments. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, that's an important part of, of what we do as sterile processing professionals is make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, yeah. for, so you're obviously very, um, you know, very well versed in the uh, topic of bonding materials. What do you see as the future of bonding materials? Um, and also, are, is there anything right now that you can think of that would really make a big impact in terms of usability, in terms of functionality, just from your perspective and just kind of dreaming what the future looks like for this topic. Yeah, no, I mean, the thing, because uh, we have these conversations sometimes, you know, but obviously manufacturers are very interested, you know, what will the future hold as far as where should product development uh, go? But then even for academic interests, we'll sit around and kind of think, well, what, you know, where, where would grant money be, and where would you know? Where do, what do we need to improve on, on dental materials? And it, you know, when we're talking about adhesive dentistry. You know, the, the the most obvious thing that always comes up is like how to make the glue better, how to make things stick better to to uh, you know dental tissues like um, dentin and enamel. But the most common failure we we recognize with dental composites and any kind of adhesive dentistry is is secondary caries or recurrent caries around our dental filling. So I think there's a decent amount of interest in how to make composites that are going to resist the, uh, or, or yeah, I guess resist getting a secondary caries around its margin. So there's some strategies that have been focused at releasing the ions present in the tooth structure so that as you start to uh, demineralize the margins of your of your uh, the tooth surrounding a restoration that you can help remineralize those. And then I guess there's also, you know, some maybe interest in, you know, the, ultimately what's causing those carry, those cavities or caries around your restorations is um, biofilm, bacterial biofilm releasing acid. And so if there's some kind of way to make composites that could repel the biofilm, uh, either kill the bacteria or prevent the biofilm from sticking to the composite or that interface, um, then maybe our fillings would last a little bit longer. So there's, I think that's something that's, I mean, it's kind of been in the works for a while, but maybe we'll get something that's more, I don't think they're, uh, they're at the point where most of us dentists would recognize them as being a huge uh, benefit yet, but maybe the technology will get there where we'll say, oh yeah, why, why do we, why do we ever use non-bio 
uh, active uh, materials previously. Um, so th that's that's one place I could see, and then maybe also um, I kind of see another l limiting fact, another tricky thing about doing adhesive dentistry with these types of adhesives and composites and cements is that you have to really isolate well from saliva. And so like if you get contamination of saliva on the tooth while you're trying to glue to it, bond to it, um, you know, that, that it can really weaken your, your bond. So looking at materials that can, uh, that are a little bit more tolerant of moisture contamination, kind of like the glass onomer type materials have been, but maybe making them a little stronger so that they can be used uh, in load bearing type of uh, posterior restoration, so those are maybe some things that you know if I'm looking on the horizon that might come as far as adhesive, you know, dentistry and and um, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. That is all the time that we have for this session. Dr. Lawson, I want to thank you so much for sharing your expertise, sharing all of the work that you're doing to push this specific niche of the dental industry forward. Um, thank you for all the important work that you're doing. For everyone tuned in, I want to say thank you again for being part of this, um, this dental conference. Um, if you have any questions that we weren't able to get to, let's say that, you know, this week, and you're sitting around the dinner table and you think, hmm, I forgot to ask Dr. Lawson that question. <laughs> no worries. You can email him directly. His contact information is on the speaker bio uh, form right on the right-hand side of your screen. As a reminder, there will be a short 15-minute break between this session and the next. We are so glad you're here. And we will see you all in the next session. Thank you so much for having me.